I'm Mohamed Bentires Alj. People call me Momo. My lab is at Friedrich Michel Institute in Basel, and we focus on the cellular and molecular mechanisms regulating normal and neoplastic breast stem cells, resistance to targeted therapy, and metastasis. I'm pleased to welcome you to conversations with key figures in mammary gland biology and breast cancer. Hi, I'm Dana Medina, the Department of Molecular and Cell Biology at Baylor College of Medicine. I'm a professor here and I work on uh, mouse mammary gland development and tumor genesis with a focus on uh, pre-malignancy. Then, we first met at the Mammary Gland Gordon Conference in Rhode Island in 2003. And I immediately felt that the mammary gland and breast cancer community is great. Do you still remember your first mammary gland Gordon conference? And can you tell us more about this must-go meeting in our field? The uh, mammary gland Gordon conference was started in 1971 uh, with a group of mammary biologists and uh, dairy science people. So it was a combination and it focused on all aspects of mammary gland development, function, and tumor genesis. I first went in 1979, and I was so captured by the meeting that I've gone to every meeting since. Originally, it was held every other year in uh, New England, and then in the year 2000, we started holding it on the opposite year in uh, Italy, Tuscany, Italy. So I've gone through all those meetings. And the reason I found it so attractive was because it dealt just with mammary gland, all aspects. So even though I'm in uh, focusing on cancer development, we heard a lot about normal mammary gland structure, function, and development, as well as what happens in the uh, cancer process. And it's a fairly tight community in the sense that the people who go there are just working on the mammary gland, uh, both mouse, some rat, and uh, now in the last, I'd say, 10, 15 years, more and more with human uh, uh, oncologists, uh, people experiment on human breast cancer. And, and the attraction is the, the focus of the, of the meeting uh, and the people who go. Thank you. You work at Baylor College of Medicine since 1969. But before, you were at Berkeley in California. And before California, you were born and you grew up in New York City. Can you tell me a bit about your personal history, birth, childhood, then your time in California and the years at Baylor? Well, that's a long story, but I'll shorten as much as possible. Yes, I was born and grew up in New York City when I was 15. Uh, my mother, who was a widow at the time, moved to Southern California, and that's how I got to California. And I went to high school in California and then the University of California, Berkeley. The University of California, Berkeley in the 60s was a very dynamic environment because there was a lot going on uh, in both um, nationally and internationally. And the campus was just a focus of activity and students opinions and uh, it was a very dynamic place and because it was when I finished my undergraduate I wanted to stay there and that's why I went to graduate school there at the Cancer Research Genetics Lab which is where I learned my uh, mammary uh, biology. Uh, when I finished my graduate work uh, there was a position open at Baylor and I was lucky enough uh, I came down and interviewed chairman was interested in the area I was working on and that's how I came to Baylor and have been here ever since because Baylor particularly our department has been a wonderful place to uh, do research and really interact with people then Medina in Arabic <laughs> means city or town it also refers to city sections in many North African cities do you have any family roots in this region or uh, of the world or in South Spain? My family roots uh, are in Spain. My uh, great-grandparents, both on my uh, mother's side and father's side, uh, migrated to Puerto Rico in the 1800s. 
And then in the early 1900s, my parents migrated to New York City. Uh, so that's the route we come from. It's, uh, uh, my great-grandfather was from southern Spain. My great-grandmother's family was from uh, the Basque region. But then what made you go into science and not arts or literature or music? Well, when I was an undergraduate, it was a toss-up uh, between history and science, because <laughs> I, I liked both, and I was uh, took courses in both. But I think science went out because I love the idea of exploration. I always wanted to ans ask questions, answer it, and then proceed deeper and deeper and deeper. And with science, which deals with living things, uh, that's what fascinated me and caught my attention. So that's why I continued on. It was just the idea of exploring. So how and, and when did you start in the mammary gland field? In uh, my graduate work, the laboratories at Cancer Research Genetics Lab at that time was focused on uh, preneoplasia in the mammary gland. And that's where I learned uh, the methodology and the science um, and all about mammary gland. And I just continued on because I became enthralled with the topic. But it was, I started as an, uh, a graduate student in this area. So what did we know back then, and what were the major challenges and questions in the fields of mammary gland development and cancer at that time? Was it all about MMTV? It wasn't all about MTV. One of the things about mammary gland, the history of mammary gland, is it's always um, uh, viewed, it's always uh, described as an interaction between hormones, genetics, and oncogenic agents. Okay. And those could be the mammary tumor viruses or uh, chemical carcinogens. And there was a lot of fascination with the mammary tumor viruses, but it was always in the view of their interaction with these other systemic factors. That's something that got lost maybe in the 80s and 90s when we became uh, more centered on the uh, transformed cell. But now it's reappearing again, and systems biology, again, is more important. But back in the 50s and 60s, it was very much a systems biology approach. What's about carcinogen-induced mammary tumors? You published a cancer research paper on this topic with the OMI in 1970. You did not have the sequencing capacities that we have now. Do you think this approach is still valid today? Okay, so I'll give you a very personal viewpoint on that. Um, I did a lot of work with chemical carcinogens in uh, the mouse model system. I think as we've learned more and more about human breast cancer, I think, in my opinion, the role of environmental chemical carcinogens plays a, only a minor role in the uh, etiology and progression of human breast cancer. So I, I haven't pursued that really in the past 15 years uh, to look at chemical carcinogens per se as an etiological agent uh, because I really want to uh, direct my research, I want to direct my research towards something that's translatable to the human. And so, no, I wouldn't spend my time on that. Other people might, but I, I don't think it's a great priority. So, so when you were... Uh junior group leader, or when, even when you were uh, students, who were your role models, and who were your mentors? I guess the role model I had was my mentor, uh, Kenneth Dion. Uh, he was a veterinary pathologist. Uh, he very much believed in uh, early uh, lesions in the mammary gland. At that time, in the late 50s, early 60s, Although these were described in the literature, they weren't very well studied. So he took it upon himself uh, to study uh, just this area and focus on early development of cancer. And he was a man who uh, uh, challenged one to, to the experiments, to the interpretations. Uh, he was a man who uh, gave me a lot of latitude in the experiments I did but always guidance when I ran into roadblocks. So he was my uh, leader, and he's the man I've tried to 
model myself. Oh, I'm sure you did. I'm sure you mentored the <laughs> generations of PhD students and postdocs. But back to your own PhD thesis. What was it about? It was about the effect of oncogenic agents on the preneoplastic transformation. Uh, at this time, uh, we got away from the emphasis on the mammary tumor viruses and looked at uh, the preneoplasias induced by other etiological agents, hormones, radiation, chemical carcinogens. And so it was asking the question is, are these similar to what one sees uh, in uh, mammary tumor virus infected animals? Do they have the same properties? Um, what is it that uh, enhances their progression? So that was the focus, again, on preneoplasias other than mammary tumor virus. Cleared fat pad assay is widely used in the mammary gland field. Do you remember the first time you used this assay? For what purpose was it? The first time I used it was when I learned. And at that time, Charles Daniel uh, was just finishing up his graduate work in, in the lab. And so I learned on one of his experiments, and he and Larry Young taught me first how to knock out mice, and then how to clear the fat pad and to inject it. We, what Charles was injecting at that time were normal mammary cells that he had grown in culture, in cell culture. Uh, so that's the first thing I did. And then I got into, once I learned the technique, I got into looking at the hormonally induced preneoplasias uh, that uh, were being developed in the lab. So this assay, the cleared fat pad assay, was recently challenged as being just a readout for the regenerative potential of mammary cells and not necessarily reflecting their normal function in an intact gland. Can you comment on this? That is a very complicated question. The cleared fat pad is very useful for looking at the regeneration potential of either normal or transformed cells. However, in some cases, it has been, the results have been too narrowly interpreted. For instance, when one sorts cells and does a, either limiting dilution or just looking at the potential of the subpopulation. Uh, the interpretation is often that the regenerative cell type has been uh, identified because in the outgrowth of normal cells, of normal morphology has been uh, reproduced. But the, that interpretation is really very limited because it doesn't take into account cell interactions and the role of the niche. And I think that if one is using that assay to inform oneself about stem cells, one has to remember that the assay itself, what you're measuring, is really on the extreme end of the normal physiology of the gland. There is cell turnover, right? in the mammary gland, both in the estrous cycle and tremendously in, in pregnancy, and at the end of pregnancy with involution. Um, Do you think this, here we this, are seeing the Heisenberg effect in mammary gland biology? We can, if we touch the system, we will perturb it and therefore cannot draw the right conclusions? Well, it, it's just that what, what you're seeing in that assay Okay, what you're using it for does not always mimic what one sees in the normal physiology of the gland. If you just, and this is often interpreted in terms of stem cells, okay, but that doesn't necessarily translate to the role, the activity of stem cells in the normal mammary gland turnover. It's the activity. The activity is, is critical. Yeah, you're measuring activity, but that doesn't mean that you measured as it happens in their normal physiology. Yes. So I think that's why I say it's too narrowly interpreted. It's a great assay, uh, but one has to be aware of what it's, it's really telling you. Then, when did you start your own lab? I came to Baylor in 1969, uh, after I finished my graduate work, and that's when I started my lab here. Uh, and it was 
was a small department, Department of Anatomy at the time, uh, and the um, chairman of the department was interested in uh, cancer research, and so that's how I started the lab, just with me, and then eventually with some students and technicians, and developed from there. Do you remember what was your first grant about? Uh, I remember my first grant was in 1971. It started in 1969. And I got my first uh, National Cancer Center grant in 1971. And it was the effect of chemical carcinogens on the pre-neoplastic transformation in the memory gland. And looking at the role of different carcinogens, the types of lesions it induced, the potential of those lesions, and if it affected uh, the host immune response. Oh, so we were talking about this back then. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. And you remember your first paper as an independent scientist. Okay, that's interesting. Because, actually, <clears throat> the first papers I did here, uh, one was on that very topic, chemical cross-energy-induced pre-neoplastic lesions. Another one was with Gloria Heppner, uh, who had been a... Uh, uh, graduate student with me at uh, Berkeley and now is independent and she was in uh, Rhode Island at the time and we were working on immunostimulation of tumor growth and this was following the hypothesis by Richard Prenn who had postulated that under certain conditions when you have a weak immune response it's stimulatory not inhibitory and we demonstrated that and, and the third paper which was even more fascinating was probably one of the first studies ever done with nuclear magnetic resonance to distinguish between um, uh, the uh, uh, normal and the pre-malignant and the malignancy in humans. And this was done with Carlton Hazelwood, who was then in the Department of Physiology. And so he was interested in the model system. So we did human and mouse with now known as magnetic resonance images, yes. but then we called it NMR. Yes. It was one of the first studies. That was, yeah, it was fascinating. fascinating yeah. Yeah. So then, what, what would you advise a junior faculty who is going to start his or her team in mammary gland and breast cancer field today? Well, several things. One, be patient. I mean, it takes several years to get your laboratory rolling and, and really at the pace at which you want it. It's not going to happen within six months. Two, I think uh, collaboration and interaction is very important because whatever department you're in, there are experts in other methodologies and fields that uh, you can learn from. Uh, and three, uh, just enjoy what you're doing. You're into it because you like it, and, and that's, I think, the best part of science research. Is fun. It is fun, yeah. But be patient. That's the main thing. Then your first paper with Gil Smith <laughs> was in cancer research in 1984. Mm -hmm. It was on expression of pregnancy-specific genes in pre-neoplastic mammary tissue from virgin mice. It was cancer research. When did you first meet Gil, and what was this paper about? I first met Gil. When I was a graduate student in 1967, and I was just studying for my qualifying exams, we had to undergo qualifying exams to continue on the program, the PhD program. Gail was a young faculty at NCI, and he had come to Berkeley to give a seminar. So he gave his seminar, and he always remembered this guy at the end of the table just looking at him with this frown on his face. And it wasn't so much I had a frown, I was just thinking so much about my qualifying exams of what I was studying. But anyway, we started a long and productive friendship then. And that paper in 1984, uh, yeah. Uh, what we were looking at was the expression of, uh, of uh, specific um, genes uh, in the preneoplasia, because preneoplasia, the cells, look like the cells of pregnancy, even though they were in a virgin environment. And indeed, we could show that these pineoplastic cells produce casein and lactalbumin, just like the pregnant gland does. But the hormonal milieu was virgin, not pregnant. So they had constitutive capability of synthesizing these genes. And it just was demonstrating that 
these cells not only look like, but acted like alveolar cells in the pregnant gland, although they were pre -malignant. So your work in rodents clearly supports the notion that early pregnancy reduces the risk of mammary cancer. Can you tell us more about your observations? What are the implications of this to human breast cancer? This is an observation that uh, pregnancy uh, induces a protective state, lifelong protective state, uh, against breast cancer, and that's seen in mice, rats, humans. Very well documented by multiple investigators. Uh, what uh, we and others show was that one can mimic the effect of pregnancy by giving estrogen and progesterone just for a three-week period. And again, that uh, induces a protective uh, effect. Now, the, the biggest hurdle of this is in the translational uh, potential of this, because we know what can protect against breast cancer. I mean, it's, it's clearly well documented extensively documented. But to translate that has been difficult because in, in Western societies, in particular now in, develop, in the developed countries, you know, pregnancy now, first pregnancy occurs uh, in the fourth decade often, you know, when a woman is in their 30s and beyond. And so that this is beyond the protective effect because it's the early pregnancy uh, before age 25, which is induces a protective effect. So that's a hurdle. But even so, you know, can we translate what we know to the human? Well, the problem has been is a lot of the uh, protective modalities based on estrogen. And estrogen has a view in, in uh, most medical uh, communities that it is harmful for development of breast cancer. And I think, so what we need to do is develop a strategy uh, and a, a, a modality which is not estrogen-centric, but is some other factors which induces the same protective genes uh, as estrogen might. And that's been the difficulty, is finding another way to do it. So we need to understand signaling pathways that are activated. Uh, the genes and the signaling pathways that are activated how that's how that's occurring in the human as well as the rodent. Yeah. You also published several papers, actually many, on the effects of selenium on mammary tumors. Can you tell us more about these studies and your conclusion? Well, in the, in the 80s and 90s, uh, selenium was thought to have great potential. And in studies with several people, Kamenev and Henry Thompson, uh, we showed that specific selenium compounds, which would be methyl selenocysteine, was a very potent uh, factor which could protect against both mouse and uh, rat breast cancer. Uh, and there was even a, a uh, clinical study done uh, which showed that individuals who were given selenium supplementation had a lower risk of, of many cancers, including breast. However, the use of selenium, I think, fell into disfavor uh, because there wasn't, one, there wasn't an, enough studies on human breast cancer to show protective effect. And two, the, the trial held over for almost 10 years on prostate cancer showed that supplementing with selenium did not induce protection, even though that prostate cancer trial had a fatal flaw in, in, in the use of the selenium that they uh, gave to the patients. Type of sleep. Yeah. It wasn't the one that was fully effective. So it was very interesting work. It got me very much interested in the area of prevention, which, you know, I've continued in area of hormone mediated prevention. Uh, but the field of selenium right now is still lacking. Uh, there's not much interest with respect to breast cancer. Back to the lab and to the models. You generated the famous. Coma D cell, cell line series. Can you tell us about these lines? What is Coma D? It was developed from uh, mid pregnant valve C mammary gland. Uh, normal cells, which we put in culture and established as a cell line, and to our surprise, it uh, produced a normal outgrowth upon um, uh, transplantation into the clear fat band. 
and it continued to do so with, with uh, passage. So it was a very nice example of normal cells that became immortalized, uh, that did not produce tumors, but had a normal potential. And indeed, uh, you could show that one could develop clones from this parental line that had different progenitor capabilities. Uh, one that was ductal-limited, so it just gave rise to ducts, another that was alveolar-limited, which suggested that the, these, these two clones were derived from progenitors of different lineages. So it's been very useful for looking at a hormonal responsiveness, a nice in vitro model. It's been very useful for looking at progenitor cells. Um, and uh, people find it uh, a good model, you know, as a transformed uh, immortal line, but not necessarily tumorgenic. So to look at properties that exist with immortalization, but not necessarily uh, malignancy. Among your uh, very recent achievement is the development of the intradactyl assay. How did you get to this assay? Why you did not think of it earlier in your career? This is so important today. Well, part of it is uh, when Craig Alfred came to Baylor in 1999 with the uh, Breast Center, with Ken Osborne and the Breast Center. Uh, he had an interest in pre-malignancy, and so we had a common area of interest. I was in rodent models, he was interested in human. And we thought, well, let's try to establish what we do in the mouse and the human. And we tried different fat pad assays to grow primary biopsy samples of the human uh, pre-malignant uh, samples, the DCIS. And although we got some growth, it was not very vigorous. And uh, we tried in combination with fibroblasts, different types of fibroblasts, and it just uh, was not very productive. And so we were just sitting around one time, and we were just talking randomly, and we said, why don't we just try uh, to mimic what happens in the human? We'll inject them into the ducts. Uh, people inject uh, solutions into ducts, various animal models in the dairy industry, it's done all the time. What happens if we inject cells, these cells, because that's where they grow. So let's see. And that's how we started. It, it was just talking and think of another way to try to achieve the same. And we said, well, let's try it. Inject it into the duck. And if they grow, you know, do they grow as DCIS and not invade? And sure enough, that's what happened. And that's how we got started on that which then led to studies on looking at different uh, genes which would uh, be involved in progression or inhibit progression. This is a perfect example of patience and collaboration and innovation. So what are the potential applications of uh, intradactyl assay? Well, right now the limitation is if you take a primary biopsy sample from the human, uh, it takes a long time for these to grow in fat pit. And when you think about what happens in the human, DCIS can exist for a long, long time. So if you take primary biopsy samples, then there's a long latency period. And there may have to be 8 to 12 months before there's a big enough mass. We know they take, for Eva has shown that they take very nicely as the primary samples. Uh, for cell lines, then uh, one could look at cell lines from different uh, genomic uh, subtype, and then look at their re regulation, what regulates progression. So it has potential, but uh, the other thing we wanted to do was to look at what happens with primary biopsy samples. And so that we hasn't been perfected yet, but I think it's, it's worthwhile still pursuing to see how we can shorten that latency to really stimulate growth. But cell lines, some of the cell lines grow very, very well. Hello Dan, we are now in Galveston for your symposium. I suggest we continue our conversations with potential applications 
of the intraductal assay? I think the biggest potential is that it be used as an in vivo assay to look at those factors which promote or inhibit a progression to invasion. I think that's difficult to do in an in vitro assay uh, because you're missing the uh, microenvironment mm -hmm. and the barrier, the myoepithelial uh, basement membrane barrier. So here it provides an opportunity to replicate that um, event okay, in an intact animal. Now there's one element that's missing uh, in the immunocompromised uh, mice, uh, but surely can be compensated for in part, and that is the uh, contribution by the mesenchymal cells. But that can be added. You can add mesenchymal cells, you can add uh, macrophages, you can add uh, uh, neutrophils. So one can also use uh, immunocompetent mice with cell lines from the genetically engineered models. Yeah, but that won't deal with the human. Sure. Yeah, and this is the advantage but you're looking at human sure. uh, cell population. But it could still help understand the transition oh, absolutely. between DCIS and invasive carcinoma. Yes, in, in, in that type of model. Uh, yeah. But I think what is desperately needed now is to look at the human yes. uh, DCIS. Mm -hmm. And that, in addition to optimizing the conditions to get biopsy specimens Correct. Yeah. to amplify in a short period of time are the two, um, right now, the two biggest hurdles. Yes. But I do think it has great potential in, that, in this area. So breast tumors are quite heterogeneous. Mm. How do you think one can deal with the complexity of this disease? Well, I think now people realize they're very complex. They've broken it down into different categories, whether uh, mainly by the genomics of them, but so that one can divide six, seven, maybe eight categories, depending on which system you want to believe. And knowing that, one can pick out the driving uh, pathways yes. in each of those subtypes and target those driving pathways. So I think, yes, breast is heterogeneous, but we're developing methods where one can identify the basis for this heterogeneity. Mm -hmm. So I don't think it's uh, a problem that presents a huge barrier, a limiting barrier. Mm -hmm. I think it's something that can be overcome. So what are the major questions that you think still need to be answered in the fields of mammary gland development and cancer? Well. In the field of mammary gland development, I think clearly one has to identify at the single cell level the stem cells and the individual progenitor cells. Until that's done, we're going to be, I think, in a very uh, confused interpretation of the role of these uh, particular cell subtypes in uh, development. Mm -hmm. But I think with respect to Normal development, I think the role of the microenvironment still needs to be clarified and is worth studying. Uh, both the microenvironment of the uh, normal virgin, also the microenvironment of the aged virgin and the Paris and the aged Paris, yes. to identify those factors which are important for modulating the uh, progression yes. of cells. So that that's I think normal is very important, and it will give us tremendous information on um, how these can apply to human, to uh, the malignancy. To malignancy yes. Yeah. With respect to malignancy, again, the role of the microbiome is very important. I also think it's important to get good models of the different subtypes of triple negative mm -hmm. breast cancer and to identify the early stages in triple negative breast cancer, which still is not understood. Yes. Are we dealing with the same type of uh, ADH and DCIS that you see in the, uh, the luminal type? Yes. And, well, and you see that in um, BRCA yes. patients. But in triple negative, um, 
what, what, what is that early lesion like? And what is the cell type that generates it? Cells I think of origin. The cells of origin, right, that generates it. Yes. What is the initiated cell? Yes. And I think that's a very important question because it's open now as sure. to whether that initiated cell is really a uh, stem cell or a progenitor, limited progenitor cell, yes. or it's some other type of cell, okay, that now reverts back to a more mm -hmm. primitive or uh, uh, multipotential yes. cell. So I think those are really important questions because, and then there's a third question that's very important, and that is how to develop, based on just what we know now, a strategy to provide uh, prevention, a prevention strategy that can be applicable to women of, in, say, in their 20s, yes. okay, if not early, but at least in their 20s, that would indeed provide a long-term uh, prevention. And we know a lot about it, but we don't know how to translate that into yes. the human yet. And so I think that's an important area which really needs a significant amount of work. Then, what's about the transition from DCIS to invasive carcinoma? Don't you think it's also very Oh, important? I think it's very important. Um, because many of the women who are diagnosed with DCIS will undergo surgery and uh, treatment, radiotherapy. Sure, and it's important to identify, you know, those pathways, those genes that are important for regulating that progression. Because DCIS can uh, exists for a very long periods of time without progression. Yeah. What is the basis for that compared to uh, DCIS that progresses Progress. very rapidly? Yes. And that's what some of these models, in vivo models now will help us to do as we get more cell lines, cell populations of DCIS which represent the different categories, then we can start to look at what distinguishing distinguishes rapid progression from poor progression at the primary sure. biopsy yes. level primary lesion level. Yeah. So I think that's extremely important. Okay. Thank you. With Peggy Neville, I think you started the Journal of Mammary Gland Biology and Neoplasia. Is that correct? And yes. Can you tell us a little yeah, bit about true. this? It was um, an offshoot of the Mammary Gland uh, Gordon Conference. Oh. And it was there that a group of people who always were going to the conference say we need uh, some type of review journal and Peggy, Nivelle and I were the ones that uh, were co-editors mm -hmm. and organized the first um, uh, issues and but we had a committee that, uh -huh. uh, at the memory gland that you know made suggestions as to what it would cover um, the editorial board mm -hmm. Uh, how often, uh, the name of the journal, I mean I remember that meeting very clearly when all these things were sorted out and then Peggy and I were asked to have the responsibility for getting it off the ground. So Peggy and I were um, co-editors for five years and then after that five year period when it was now running very reproducibly and uh, given at a quarterly basis, published on a quarterly basis, mm -hmm we um, passed it on to another set of co-editors. And so it's been passed on to co-editors, new co-editors, about every five, six years. Okay. But it, it came from the Mammary Glenn Gordon Conference. Okay. Yeah. yeah, just just the ideas of what yeah. people felt was needed in the field Absolutely. to have this type of review journal which is just focused on the Mammary Glenn. And so I think it's been very successful, very helpful, particularly uh, for um, students and postdocs sure. uh, because they can go back and look at yes. the old literature and see what new areas are being discussed. Yeah, in so the last method, ish, Methods issue we even published the video of the, the original video of the cleared fat pack. That's right, yeah. yeah. So it, it's been very helpful I think and useful. So then, what would you like to tell the next generation of scientists who will watch this video? I think there are several things I would like to stress that I, that would make it uh, an experience, positive experience for them. One, you clearly got to enjoy what you're doing. 
I mean, if you want to do research in this area, you have to enjoy the experimentation and also enjoy asking questions. Uh, secondly, I think you, you need to recognize that, you know, you answer one question and it's going to give rise to another deeper question. That really you're, you're looking at a phenomena which is extremely complex and involves the total uh, systems biology of the organism. And stresses this point that if you're going to understand the evolution of mammary cancer, you have to understand normal development, all the factors that are involved in normal development, which are then perturbed during uh, initiation and progression, mm -hmm. and the role of the microenvironment, systemic factors, hormones produced by the host, uh, and how different um, ex and exogenous exposures affects not only the target organ, okay, not only the memory cell, but the host as well. Um, so I think that's very important for people entering the field to understand. It, it's, it's a very complex organ. It's a marvelous organ to work with. There are marvelous um, model systems that are available now. Uh, there's a wealth of background, which brings me to the point that don't limit yourself to the past five, six years. You really go back in the literature to see the questions that were asked and what's been done, uh, what has worked and what hasn't worked. Uh, because now, you know, you're in a position to uh, probably probe and ask, answer questions that we couldn't do 25, 30 years ago with the modern technologies. But so those questions are still relevant. And, and then finally, uh, to remember that um, if you're studying the mammary gland, okay, you, you really have to know the normal development. You know, you can't ignore the normal development. So if you understand that, it'll help you to understand the changes that you're looking at, the disease progression. And finally, you know, it's a wonderful career and you can have lots of fun in it. And don't ignore the element of just enjoying doing the research because that's very important. Science is fun. Yeah, science is fun. That's correct. So then, the French philosopher Michel Montaigne said, Teaching is not about filling a vase, it's about igniting fires. Mm -hmm. Can you comment on that? Sure. To me, what, that, what he was saying, the way I interpreted it, was that uh, you listen to what is being said. And the purpose of that is not only to give you a set of facts, but to inspire you, to stimulate you, to go on and ask more questions. That you, you, you come to a point, you know, after this exploration, and you come back to a point where you really started, and, but you just know a lot more, and you have a lot more questions. So when you're hearing a lecture, the purpose is to excite in your imagination as to what you can do, okay, with your particular viewpoint and skills. Thank you, Dan. The last question. Okay. Is there any question that I should have asked, but I did not? Oh, I think you covered a, a wide area. Uh, right now, I can't think of anything that uh, I haven't answered, and you haven't asked. Thank you very much, so, Dan. It has been a pleasure uh, conducting pleasure. this interview with you. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.